There we go. Which ones have you enjoyed the most? Hi, Bernard. Where are you from, Bernard? Oh, Milwaukee, cool. Hi, Judy. How are you today? Great to have you guys join us on Saturday afternoon and evening. Where are you from, Judy? everybody. Oh, that is cool that you guys are uh, giving a chance to follow each other on Twitter. On my agenda for this year, to learn to use Twitter. Debbie, where are you from? I've seen you in moderating quite a few sessions. Oh, my sound needs to go up again, huh? Okay, let me see what I can do. Is that better? Hi, Lynn. Is that better, Lynn? I guess like Judy was saying she was having trouble hearing me. Anyone else? Let me try that again. Is that better? How's that? Hmm. I've got my mic on. I'm hoping that that helps a little bit. Oh, not hearing again. Let's try that again. How's that? Better? Hmm. It's working pretty well just a minute ago, so I'm hoping that. No, any better now? 
Still low. How's that? Keep fooling around with it on the smite. So I'm hoping you like helping a little bit. It's odd. It was working about 10 minutes ago pretty well. Yeah, it was great earlier. How's that? Any better? I'm going to close it to my mouth. Uh, no, I just put the headset in a little bit differently. I'm looking to see what I might have changed. Hmm. Hmm. This is going up. Okay, that is, yeah, I'm about as close to the mic as I can get. I'm having a hard time here. Try that. How's that? Yeah, quite, still quite low. That's really weird. It was fine a little bit ago. Yeah. Let's try hit this again. That my uh, tech support here helping me. I'm just going to see if we can turn the speakers up a little bit. Okay, how's that sound? Any better? Hi, Sinaj. No, that's not better. Okay. Maybe I just need to go to that, huh? Okay. What do you think? Let's go up here. I'm going to try just using the, um, the built-in one. See if that works. Go to audio. I'll just use my microphone. Let's just turn it off. Do that again. See if I can adjust it up. Control up. Okay. Hi hey everyone, this is Debbie. Can you let me know if you can hear me, please? Yes, I can hear you, Debbie. Is it nice to pull in from my webcam? I let them hear Debbie. They just can't hear me. Okay, I'm going to ditch the mic then. Hi, Monica. This is Debbie. So it sounds like it might be a sound issue on your end with your mic because I'm talking and everyone can hear me. Thanks, everyone, for being patient while we figure out the mic situation. Okay, 
Can you hear me better now? I just tried a different mic. See if that's working better. Yes, good. Awesome. All right. Yay. <laughs> oh, I love technology when it works. And I technology is a pain when it doesn't work. I'm in. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Well, I'm really glad to have everybody join us. I can see there's some other folks here, too. Jamie and Chris and Judy. I will uh, see if I can get myself organized here now that I've just moved everything around and managed to spill a glass of water too. So we're all good. Okay. Um, I'm so glad everybody's here. I think I've got the right screen up here. And I'm going to go to the next one so everybody can tell me a little bit about um, where you're from. I guess I started the recording. I think that's all right. I think if I give you guys permission, you can tell me a little bit about where you're from and um, what brings you here today. What would you like to learn about? I can kind of talk about self-design for a long time, so I usually if folks can uh, put in here a little bit about what you'd like to learn about, and I'll tell you a little bit about the book. Oh, it looks like I see someone from California. I should probably tell you guys I'm from Michigan. I can put my little screen there. Yeah. Los Angeles and Berkeley. Great. San Mateo. Steve's saying he's North Carolina. And you heard Brent a while back, New Orleans. Somebody says they're having trouble putting their things on the you can put yourself on the map if you like. You can drag it over. Sometimes it works for me, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, my star isn't working real well either. Click the second star, and then click on the map. That's what I did before. Thanks, Debbie. Great. Oh, you're on your iPad. Yeah, I couldn't do that either, Chris. Kathy Ann, I think the star is the second one down from the top. Yeah. It's someone in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's okay there. Good. If you're on an iPad, yeah, you might not be able to do that. The toolbar should be alongside where it says participants. Great. Well, I was mentioning to folks that um, I'm Monica Cochran, and I'm from Ann Arbor, and I've been Working. Oh gosh, now I got some. I see Kathy Ann from New Jersey. You got someone a little bit up near Maine, maybe, or cool. Hi, Lainey. Hi, Allison. I know. Ella. I remember. I think I met you, Allison, uh, back in the day when I think I was there with Haya Gray. Good to good to have you. You guys were doing a um, home learning group. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Yes, e cubed. That's what it was. Yes, awesome. Yep, I remember that now. Okay, hope well, everybody's had a chance to kind of check in and see where everybody's about, where we're from. Um, I mentioned a couple of folks here. I know a couple of folks from before. I can talk a lot about self-design, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and Brent and River's book. Let's see if I can get to my slides here. I love technology when it works, and my mouth is kind of going a little slow for me here, but I will get over here. There we go. I loaded my slides. Go to the next slide. Oh, my 
get down there. Oh, my slides aren't moving. I think maybe I have to get out of this. Let's see if I can get out of that. And let's see if I can move my slides over. Looks like everything's here. Uh, let's see. No, no. Hi, Jen. Great to have you join us. Debbie, I'm having a little bit of trouble getting my slides to work. Would you be able to help me? There we go. Thanks. There's the cover of the book. Really appreciate it. And um, this is the second edition. I met Brent when um, he wrote this book. I've been uh, working with folks since the mid-70s. And I had a chance to meet Brent in 2005. Oh, great. I'm so glad that's, that the sound got better. Good. And at any rate, I'll just do my little introduction then in case you didn't hear. But uh, I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I've been working in education um, since the mid-70s. Did a little public school, a lot of alternative schools and special ed. My background's in child development and uh, special education. Um, I had an opportunity to work with kids as young as infants and adults and worked with engineers and trained teachers for a while, so it's been um, quite a journey. But I had a chance to meet Brent in um, 2005, right after I worked. Him and I had been home learning um, since 1994. So it had been a looking around, and self-designed philosophy just resonated with me. Uh, we had dinner, and I read the book, and we worked on a few projects together for a couple of years. And then in 2007, um, I began working with self-design. Um, it really integrated my background in child development, holistic education, um, combined some multiple intelligence work, um, loved it a lot. Um, so I can't really share everything that's in the book with you in a really short period of time, but I think that we can help a little bit. This really um, is the work of well, over 20 years of Brent working with kids and adults and to nurture the love of learning and so that everyone really can become a self-directed learner. Let's see if I can move to my next slide. Let's see if it works for me. Debbie, or I might need your help here. Let's see. Yeah. Brent looked at this and saw that um, he wanted to see a new paradigm of learning where the curriculum is the expressed interest of each and every learner along the way. So he really began questioning, you know, do we really need to have a one-size-fits-all kind of curriculum? Hmm. Hope my things move. Debbie, I think I might need your help again here. I'm not sure exactly why my slides work sometime and sometimes they don't. Go to the next page. No? That's awesome. Are you just wanting to go to the next slide, Monica? Yeah, and um, I'm on the uh, arrow and it's just not clicking. I mean, it's not moving. Can you move it to the next no, one? Let me see if it works for me. Hold on. Thanks. Yes, there we go, thanks. Well, he really recognized that um, we said compulsory work for children was illegal. However, we didn't, so I'm going to ask you to move it again, we didn't really think the same thing about children. And I don't know why it's not moving ahead. Yeah, I need help advancing again. Just, I'm not just, sure why. Just prompt me, Monica, and I'll do it for you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, something, I just try to, okay. So we really didn't understand that why do we need to have that kind of a compulsory learning as well. So what he did was he looked at self, I think I got it to work now, Deb. Um, Self-design, we work with each child to co-create an individual curriculum that's based upon their, you know, their curiosity and their enthusiasm. And Brent's inspiration for this book is the little girl in the picture. That's Alana with her mom. And he was very committed to providing her with a relationship and a learning environment that would help her develop her own curiosities and her potential. And that worked very well when they were preschoolers and working at home. And then they went time for kindergarten came. And after a few weeks of being in school, Lana said, you know, Dad, I don't think I want to go back to school anymore. I don't get to learn what I want to learn when I want to learn it. And that set them on a new journey in 1982. That was the beginning of Wonder Tree. Brent started with a couple of kids and Ilana and he began watching and was curious about what was going to help the kids learn. He observed each child 
and he looked at their strengths and their interests. Um, he approached learning from a whole new paradigm. And along the way, he developed some models. And we learned that when the kids could follow their own interests and they were able to create their own plans, that they came up with some marvelous opportunities. They did some project-based learning. They created a hypercard program that helped kids take a virtual tour through a valley. Um, they researched, they designed, they shared, they, dis they created a power smart game, uh, which they sold to um, BC Hydro and the city of Pasadena. So he really took this to a whole new level. As Alana grew, so did Brent's interest. He started a high school in 1993. And he became very, very interested in the rights and the responsibilities of learners. And this group of kids here began to study those rights and responsibilities and actually took a little, oops, I'm sorry, um, actually went to, um, to Holland at the time and researched the convention and took a look and said, well, if, if UNESCO and everyone thinks it's wonderful for kids to have the right to learn, maybe it doesn't need to be in the paradigm of Western schooling. So they actually took a look at it and wrote the rights and the responsibilities of learners, which now UNESCO sends out and publishes around the world. So it was a huge feat for them. Um, along the way, Brent said, let's take a look at the, this. And he created a learning community in 2002 with 100 learners and 10 learning consultants and worked with home learners to help them design their own learning. Today we have 150 learning consultants and over 2,000 learners around the world. So this is kind of a little bit of our story. Unfortunately, Brent passed away last year and left us a legacy um, to carry on. The little girl, the woman on the right is Atlanta and she's an accomplished musician and is carrying on the work of her dad. So he left us quite a mission. He left us a mission to say, does the one size fit all curriculum really benefit? And I know when I think of learning, I kind of remember looking just like that little girl, right? Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Jane. I feel very, you know, happy to be part of the community too. And I'm sure if I polled everybody, you probably have some similar memories of being in school. But he looked at learning in a different way. And he looked at learning through the metaphor of a plant. And that's a very different way of learning. It's, it's a shift away from the sage across the stage, you know, the factory model, more to being a guide along the side. And he realized that, that we really needed to do this. So when we do, when we work with learners in this way, we plant the seeds of curiosity and enthusiasm. You know, we nurture them. Uh, we offer them opportunities to help them mature and grow. And then as they grow and learn, we plant new seeds. You know, so I think this learning becomes a transformational process. It's not just what skills and knowledge our learners, you know, really learn. I think it's also the people they become. So we start with learners. These are the sensibilities that we start with. Um, and yeah, you know, Lainey, I was a Montessori direct, director as well. Yeah. Yeah, this has been a next stage. It was for me, too. I'm looking at the chat things here. Oh, AJ, yeah, definitely. Talk with us about it. We can see what we can do to help you. But this metaphor of a plant and growing is a living and a live model. And it just helps a lot. I'm going to show you a couple of ways to how this works with our learners, too. What we do is we start with the learner. And we put the learner in the middle of the page and we create a mind map. And this is a very busy older learner here with lots and lots of things that she likes to do. <laughs> and um, sometimes they look like this, and sometimes the learner doesn't want to draw. The learner wants to just cut pictures out. And this one's done with um, inspiration. And sometimes the learner likes to sit in the middle kind of a kinesthetic learner, and we put all of their interests and their passions, and we ask them, you know, what are some things that you like to do? What are some things that you would like to continue doing that you're already doing? You know, what are the, and Jen goes, that's my daughter, that is. <laughs> what kind of things do you like to do by yourself? What kind of things do you like to do with other people? Uh, what do you need help doing? What do you, 
You know, what, you know, if time and money weren't a thing, what would you like to do? So this becomes really um, a mandala. It becomes a mind map of possibilities and opportunities. You know, what would you like to try out just once? You know, what do you want to do every day? What do you want to do every week? So what we do is we take this mind map of all their possibilities, and we create a learning plan. Now, this is a gal that has some definite interests. Um, this one, she loves fashion and gardening and horses and guitars and soccer. And she's going to learn all the skills that she needs to learn. She'll learn to read and write and do math within the context of the things that she's really interested in. So we work with a learning consultant. And from this, we co-create our learning plan. We take those interests that are on there and we map them. And Brent came up with an awesome model. And the model is our self-designed mandala. And this mandala takes all of the things that are you have in regular education, but in a much more holistic way. We look at the body, the heart, the mind, and the spirit. And we'll create a mind map. Of, and we'll kind of plot it out. And always remembering that the map is not the territory. This is kind of our compass. The, and some kids will do it with a Google Doc. And other people will do it on a big sheet. And you know, in our learning programs, we tend to do it online now so everybody can share it. But it becomes our compass for the year. And as you look around, we incorporate you know, our personal planning and our journaling and wellness, um, language and English and interpersonal things and relationships and humanities and social studies. Down to 6 o'clock, though, we have another piece where people begin thinking about you know, their weekly planning. And Jen's saying her kids call it their road map. And um, as you go around the 7 and the 8 o'clock, you see logic and math and tools for living and science. And these are where all of the kids' ideas and things can be put in. And then there's the creativity and art. And then there's the philosophy part. And it's just a lot of, and then at the top, we kind of say, OK, how does this look? So each learner gets to create a learning plan. And in that learning plan, it's not just what they want to learn, but it's how they want to do it. And it's a co-creative process. It tells us a little bit about their strengths and the strategies and the resources. So we also kind of work on this together. And we co-create it. And it yeah, goes through a number of revisions along the way. It's pretty awesome. So then from this, this is kind of the what. Let me see if I... But we also knew that, that learning doesn't just look like that little girl sitting with her paper and pencil. Learning turns up in a lot of different ways. So another model that that Brent came up with, something called the Paragon. And the Paragon is the how of learning. Because most of us, if I did a poll, would think about learning probably pretty much down in that three, that rote learning. That's how most of us had learned. But there's so many different modes of learning that we may not be recognizing in our day-to-day -day life. And this was a piece that when I was working with home learners, and I read Brent's book. This was the piece that spoke to me right away. And it said, you know, every day our learners are learning. And they're learning in their life. And unfortunately, we only see what we know and what we've been exposed to. So this helps us take a look at all the different ways of learning, modeling, enthusiasm. And rote learning is definitely a part. How I look at myself as a learner. You know, what kind of goals can I set for myself, projects. Uh, the role of mentoring, both being a mentor and having mentors, and working collaboratively. So if you take a look at this, there's different kinds of learning. And so right in the middle is that zero point. And that point is so important because the key thing there is what we bring to the learning process. What state are we in? Are we in a resourceful state? Um, are we fearful? Are we afraid? What kind of beliefs do we have about learning? Does learning have to be hard? Does learning have to be easy? Um, those are the sensibilities that we bring, both as a learner and as a mentor. And then if you look at modeling and enthusiasm and rote learning, that's kind of how we figure out how the learning is as a process. What's that process like for us? And we know that kids are learning all the time from us. They model us. Any of the time that we've been in traffic and we've used a uh, special little word and our kids model, we know they're modeling. And sometimes we think their enthusiasm might look a little silly, but some of them, they need that. 
And then there's that piece where they're going to do that rote learning. So there are some things they do need, and they understand they need to know them, and they accept that piece. So that's kind of learning as process. If you look at four and five, you begin to see that learning is also a strategy. We learn strategies for learning. We figure out how to put things in categories. We set goals. We begin to be involved in assessing our own learning. Uh, we begin to understand some of the verbal and nonverbal kind of communication. So as we become better at looking inside and seeing what kind of a learner we are and what kind of strategies work, then we can begin to see learning as a conversation and a pattern. And that's when we begin working with mentors and we work on group projects and project-based learning. Um, this work, and Jen can probably speak to this, has really inspired a lot of the group work uh, that Brent did in Wonder Tree and Virtual High. We've done it in our um, self-design inspired communities in Austin and the, the home learning community that Jen's working with in San Diego. We've begun doing it in our global program by taking the, the learning plans and learning mind maps of all the different learners and, and mapping them to see where their common interests are and who learns in similar ways. It's just been a very inspiring uh, process. At the top is the life class, and that's how we find out what is our purpose here. By going through this process of looking inside as well as looking outside, we get a chance to see what kind of learner we are. Now, a question that generally comes up um, after we talk about the model, we talk about all the different ways of learning, is a concern, and that is how do we know our kids are learning? And that tends to come up um, in almost every conversation. This is all good, but how do I know that they know? And we have a very powerful process of observing for learning. And when our kids are observing for learning, it's really based on a, a concept that everything is seen by the observer. We're observers of our own inner and we're observers of our outer world. And I know that sounds like a lot of, hmm, what does that really mean? And could I really do that? And yet, we've been doing it. Parents and caregivers have been doing this work since the beginning of time. We do it with our babies. We do it with our young children. We observe them. We watch. We notice. We get enthusiastic. We model what they're doing. We follow what they're doing. We take cues from them. Because that's really what observing for learning is all about. It's not a clinical observation, and it's not just a list of activities. It's basically, what is the child doing, and what are they saying about it, and how are they feeling about it? Um, because what a child feels and thinks about is, is as important. And it's about those conversations that go on in families, the questions and the concepts. And one of my colleagues, Kathleen Sel uh, Forsyth, has done uh, a whole session on observing for learning. It's that big of a topic. So I can just touch on it briefly. But through working with our learning consultants, our families um, get coaching in this, and they become confident that they, they do observe learning. And we have an, a concept called adequate conduct. And it, it's not the way that we do testing in school. It's a way of knowing that learning is occurring because we've been engaged with that learner. We've been asking the important questions. What is this learner enthusiastic about? How are they responding to the learning experience? And it kind of gives us the clues to say, this is what we want to do next based on what we see now. And it's not just words. Um, we have folks in um, Australia that use their, their iPhones, and they use their video cameras, <laughs> and they record it, and they get a chance to see it. And they also share it with their children so that their children have the opportunity to do that too. We really honor the growth process of the learner. Uh, we trust that the caterpillar is going to transform into the butterfly with enough time and with enough nurturing. I love, uh, Brent used to always tell the story that um, we don't paste, you know, little wings on the caterpillar and expect it to fly. We just wait and we nurture it and we help them get ready. And so often in schools we look at testing and looking at ways of assessing lots of kids at one time. In many ways, if we compare that to the learning metaphor, it would be like pulling up the carrots every week. You know, um, we really have to trust and feed and water the carrots. Um, we don't need to pull them up every week. So when we move beyond 
that idea, we can do what we call seasonal reviews, we can do annual reviews, and we can begin to see the growth of our children. Now, Brent wasn't one to stop researching. He continued to grow and develop. Um, as I said, self-design stands on the shoulders of Montessori and Waldorf and Virginia Satir's work and neuro-linguistic programming, but he also was very much interested in multiple intelligences. And that is a very important part in how our kids learn and what are their natural intelligences and how can we adapt the learning process to meet their needs. And so we have a few more than Gardner. We have like 10 or 12, actually. So we keep adding to them. We may add some few more along the way as well. Brent also had a big interest in neuroscience. And I shared his interest in how the brain works. Because we've learned more about the brain in the last 15 to 20 years than we probably have known in the previous 200. And this, we call the neural rows, it really helps us understand that our body, heart, mind, and spirit does correlate to different parts of our brain and different brain circuits. And this work is just in its infancy. We're just beginning to understand the amazing correlations and the interconnectedness of our brain. Again, in self-design, we don't think that um, life just stops when we leave school. Brent was fascinated by the excuse me, by the Fibonacci number code and just how the symmetry in nature. And so along the way, he noticed that nature is very amazing. There's a logarithmic principle that we see in the seashells. We see it in Hurricane Sandy. We see it in the relationships of the different parts of our body, of our finger to our joints to our hand. But this Fibonacci sequence is very important because it gives us a metaphor, and he designed a, a life spiral that helps us begin to reflect, to plan, to look at our life in a new perspective. And Brent was very dedicated uh, to lifelong learning. And so this model right here helps us each take a look at ourselves at different points in time. And we can take a look and take a look at our reflections. We can look ahead. We can take the perspective of other people. And all this, right now, we use the model, but we also have built actual uh, life spirals. We have two or three in North America, and we also have them built um, on beaches and in backyards around the world. But this life spiral helps our learners, and all of us as lifelong learners, take a look at where we are at different points in our life. We can look back and reflect on what it was like to be a child and the developmental parts. And we can also look forward and maybe even take a look for children, take a look and wonder what the world looks like to my grandfather or my mother or my cousin or someone else um, that I'm not so close to. I'll see if I can move this here forward. So Brent left us a legacy. And this is um, a picture of us working with some folks in um, Australia. And we work with parents and we work with kids. And we gather together and we gather together once a week um, on go to meetings and talk about the different philosophies and principles and actually how to self design in our own lives. So I don't want to talk a lot. I kind of want to give everybody else a chance to ask some questions, have some thoughts. Let me see what I can do here. So if you'd like to learn more, the, the book has some great ideas. Um, I want to leave some time here for questions and comments. Let me see if I can turn the mic on here. Done for everybody, I think. How's that? I'm going to look here in the chat room. I might have uh, missed some of your questions here, too. I think Lainey was saying that um, she was in Montessori, and it does stand on the shoulders of Montessori very much. Let's see. It looks like here Jane says, 
what possibilities do we see for outreach to families with preschool children? We do actually have um, an outreach program. We have um, our learning circles. And in fact, the folks that you um, saw on this, video, this slide before, many of these folks have preschool children. And we meet with them once a week and help them plan. We do a lot of family visioning. Um, how do we want to be in our family with our kids, noticing with their sensibilities, learning a little bit more about child development and how that, that works. But yeah, just um, send me an email, Jane, and I can uh, share a bit more with you about that. I think there was another question down here too, but I can't get to it. Does the book include a, a special needs section? You know, we have a very, very um, large, and I think Jane can have maybe speak to it. We do have a whole section on um, kids who learn differently. In fact, Brent worked with a number of kids who other schools had said they had different. He generally didn't use a label. He just said, let's meet the learner where the learner is and look at the relationship and adapt what we're doing to meet the needs of learners. So there's um, some amazing stories in the book about kids who were, quote, dyslexic or had learning disabilities. And really, we just had, didn't give them enough time to learn and grow in the way they needed to do that. I hope that answers your question, Michelle. I think we can probably just turn on your mic if you have it. You want to just talk. I think um, maybe Jen, you can also let me speak to a little bit of um, working with kids with special needs. Can you hear me? First talk, or can you guys hear me? Great. Um, you know, we have actually quite a few learners in our global program with special needs, and I think one of the really unique things about self-design is the ability to work with all learners exactly where they're at. So, um, and the other piece of, of that is that self-design looks different for every family. So what one family um, how one family chooses to learn with their children may look differently than how another family chooses to learn. So we would just take into account uh, goals and desires and interests uh, that the parents have as well as the goals and desires and interests of the child when we do our co-creating. Does that possibly answer that? Great question. Um, I think um, Allison was asking, you know, what kind of questions do we ask that drive the creation of the mind map? And that's a good one. We ask kids, what do you like to do? You know, um, if they've been in school, we say, you know, school, and they're just coming out of a um, more structured learning experience, we may ask them, you know, um, you know now that you know, school took up a lot of your time, um, what would you like to do now that you have more time? The other question is, you know, what do you, what do you, what are you interested in doing? What do you like to do? Um, what are some some new things that you might want to do that you haven't ever done before? Or what are, what are some things you're doing right now you'd like to have more time to do? You know, um, with the little ones, you know, what kind of things do you like to do with your mom and dad? What kind of things do you like to do with your friends? Uh, what do you do when you're all by yourself? Sometimes we just, they'll, and oftentimes when we do our Skype chat, they run around their room and show us all the cool things they do. So we're not so interested in them having to kind of write them down, but the questions we ask are the ones, I think, that um, really help. And Jen's just putting in here that she does the, um, the mind maps as a family, and that really is a, a cool way. Love the question Steve's asking, how do we make the links between individual learners so they can learn together? Well, Jen and I just did that um, this summer. And what we did was we were talking and we were looking at uh, mind maps of the kids that we were working with. And we noticed there were some overlaps. And we actually created a little Greek, ancient Greek kids club. And that really, um, they just loved it. And they were from 
Australia and New Zealand and South Africa and Mexico and the United States. And um, they got together online synchronously. That was a little hard because we had so many uh, time zones, but it was, um, we were able to get them together asynchronously. Um, AJ, you're asking, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Do we have any self-designed learners in India? We have some folks in our learning circle, some adults. We don't have any children yet, but we'd love to have some. Yeah, we do have, um, we have folks, adults that are in our learning circle that are from India. Indeed. Um, Allison, did I answer your question about the questions? Because the questions kind of evolve out of what the kids say. Um, it's kind of an organic process. So I may have some starter questions. But generally, when I'm uh, working with a learner and they're, we're co-creating that mind map, it's usually a pretty organic process based on what the kids say. Michelle's saying, do we have high school transcripts? Yes, we do. Um, we are accredited through advanced ed, so um, our high school kids can earn credit. And um, the nice thing is they have a lot of different ways they can do it. Oh. Oh, I must have missed a question. Jen's saying, Steve, we also have a highly, oh, I forgot, we have a Minecraft server that our learners can be on. Right. Mm, okay, we're getting too many questions. Uh, I got to, let's see if I can move back up here in the chat room. Yeah. Monica, the last question is the differences between self design global and self design BC. Yeah, I saw that one. And then Kathy Ann was also mentioning here that um, we do have adult learning circles. That's what this is right here, this uh, picture is, of the folks over in Australia and New Zealand. So that was pretty awesome. And that we do have a Minecraft server for kids. Um, they can meet up there and they can create projects. And they've done a Roman Colosseum and a Greek Parthenon and villages. So that's really awesome. Okay, Jane's asking, can we talk about the difference between the self-design program in British Columbia and the global program? The self-design uh, learning community in uh, British Columbia is a, a ministry-funded program. And so there, um, the learners in British Columbia can enroll in our program, and they choose a learning consultant, and they observe for learning every week. And that's a ministry-funded program that they then track everything to the learning outcomes that are in British Columbia. It's a very vibrant community. Um, it's grown phenomenally over the last 12 years, and it's just a very robust program. And you can go to selfdesign.org to learn more about that. In 2008, um, one of Brent's visions was to take self-design beyond British Columbia, and we created the self-design global learning programs. And those are for folks that are outside of British Columbia. And that's a self-funded program. And um, our learners there um, enroll in learning paths, um, work with learning consultants. And we can um, work with learners anywhere from very young with their parents all the way up through high school. And that program is growing because people really want some alternatives um, to the regular you know, private schools and public schools. Uh, and we are accredited by Advanced Ed as well. Now, the other piece I think that's um, very important, we also have learning circles, parent learning circles for parents who would like to learn more about self-designing in their family. We have a lot of folks who have preschoolers that um, want to come in and learn a little bit more. Also, we have just starting educator learning circles as well for educators who are looking to develop learning communities that are similar um, to either the one in British Columbia. We also have a learning community uh, forming in Winnipeg. Um, and also we have one in Austin. And New Zealand, we have one growing there as well. So I hope that answered your question. It's a pretty detailed kind of explanation. I hope I didn't talk around it too much for you. Um, AJ, you're asking a question. Sure, I'll be happy to talk with you. We have, an, um, you have a 10-year-old who's currently being homeschooled by your wife. Mm -hmm. Sure. The global program is available to folks all over the world. I think we have people on all the, con <laughs> all the continents except for Antarctica. <laughs> Are there virtual family groups? Yes, we do have a virtual learning circle for, for families. Mm -hmm. 
and I am. I'm part of the global program, um, the director of the global learning program, and I'm also part of the special ed program in BC. Okay, got another question. When we design the learner, do we align the learning outcomes such they align with the standards in India? You know, that's a really um, good question. We can align learning um, with outcomes. Um, it's not a requirement in our program. However, many of our folks live in places that require that for folks who are home learning. Uh, Jen helps folks in California. I've worked with folks in Pennsylvania and North Carolina and other places. And what we do is we take that learning that's going on and we connect the dots so that um, their governing body can see that the learning is occurring. Jane's saying here that she's in the BC program. She's in love with the concept because you work in the area of global collaboration. Oh, let's talk, Jane. Love to talk with you some more. Um, Jen's letting you know that she's a learning consultant with Self Design, uh, works with our global learners. Um, and Jen and I share um, a similar background in special ed. And one of our frustrations often was that we would design an quote, individualized education plan and then look for a program to put our learner in. And here in Self Design, we really can. Uh, take a look um, at, even if a learner has special needs, let's take a look at their special strengths as well. And, you know, create a, um, a learning plan to be able to do that. Um, Jane, you mentioned that MontessoriCompass.com. I haven't had a chance to look at that yet, but that really does look interesting. And we do have, um, self-design has learning outcomes that are related to self-design, and then we also certainly have them that relate to the um, ministry. Funding too. Oh, and Kathy Ann says she has South Africa ones. Um, at the end, for elementary students, um, AJ, what we have um, at the end of the year is an annual review. We kind of take a look at the review and um, see what that is. And we have issued, uh, you know, completion letters and things like that. And then uh, for high school, we do have a transcript. I think Jane's mentioned that she started playing with Montessori Compass and likes the ability to make the connections. Yeah, I understand that. Michelle's saying, love the strength and the interest of focus for all kids. I think that's probably one of the, the strongest points that we had. And Brent really had um, an understanding and an ability to shift the perspective and take on the perspective of a learner. Take a look at the situation from more than one perspective. Um, and not look at just how can the learner fit in the box. And um, Debbie's saying, is the review similar to Waldorf, what they write up? It is a very holistic learning. What we do is we take a look at the learning plan, we look at the observing the learning that's occurred, and then we do a summary. But it's a very holistic summary. Um, AJ said she'd like to explore this option. How do you move forward? Just you can go out to selfdesign.com. Okay. Oh, hang on one second. I'll put the slide up here. What if I it might be easier to type it in? My mouse isn't working real well. There you go. That's where you can look it up. Sounds good. Thanks, Debbie. That would be really helpful. Jane, you're saying that would be amazing, but I'm not sure what you're saying amazing to. You can turn your mic on. <laughs> I, I was just saying that actually having spent the last day or so, well, day and a half, I guess, in this conference, I was wondering if there had ever been any sort of a global self-design conference like this, because that would be really amazing. Well, you know, we've talked about this, and the idea is definitely percolating. <laughs> So we would definitely like to do that. That would be a great idea. That's great. And a lot of yeah, fun. Too. That, that would be really <laughs> wonderful. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And, and AJ, we would love to talk with you too. Um, we think that's a really good idea to, to know your learner a little bit more. But um, if you just request some information, we can be in touch and set up a Skype call or go ahead and talk with you. Yeah, we'll have to talk to Steve about that, huh? So this is a good setup, actually. I'm quite pleased. Any other questions? 
Yeah, sibling discounts. Yes, there are. There are some. We do make accommodations for families that have more than one child enrolled. Kathy Ann, do you have anything you'd like to share about uh, your experiences with self-design? Well, I, I, I found, I had a group of homeschoolers and we found self-design by book ourselves and, and were able to enjoy a lot of the ways they had captured the model and realized how similar our model was. So now that the guys are, are launched and they're actually going through their next life phase and starting to call with, hey, can we start a baby group? What do we do? <laughs> As they move to the next stages in their lives, I'm finding joy in being with self-design and people starting out and working as a learning consultant with other people following in the same path because the kids and the development and the adding to Brent's work is just so cool. Cool. You know, Michelle, that's a great question. Is there a portfolio? We do create um, a portfolio of the kids' work. They each have their own little site and um, online, and we can upload their work. We're in the process right now. Our IT folks are creating a community site where we'll be able to, it'll be a little bit easier to upload the video and the audio. So we're quite excited about that and looking forward to that unfolding over the year, so that'll be cool. But we love to keep um, a portfolio of the work. It, it's a very exciting. I just got a chance, and we're also uh, designing this very cool um, piece where we can keep the, re uh, the reflections, and it looks like a little path so that people can see their reflections over time. And Jen's just putting in that the portfolio is one of our key methods for documenting the learning process. Because again, as, as we shift away to just creating artifacts and we pay attention to the process, um, it does help over time to be able to see the, the changes. Because we're, we are so close to it, we don't see it every day. But it is helpful to have a learning consultant be able to review, review with you over the year. And then we see the changes from the six-year-old who's not reading to the nine-year-old who is reading, or the, um, the drawings and the moving from kind of a concrete stage to a more symbolic way. Kathy Anna, I'm so glad you're saying we share the process with the learner, so we are standing with them, you know. And when we look at assessment, we kind of, there's a, a way of looking at it where we say we sit beside. We sit beside the learner and look at the learning together. Oh, how do we find out-of-the-box resources for unique interests? Oh, every way that we possibly can. Um, usually we start with the learner, though, because that's usually where we get our, our inspiration. And then we do have a whole community of people, so it's wonderful. Jane's saying that her first year was all about learning to relax and let go of expectations right. And Elsie's a chosen for quirkiness, yes. <laughs> we, love to, we love to research quirkies. And you know it's amazing because once you get to know learners as people, you start thinking and then when something comes across your life, you think about, oh, well, that would be awesome for Jen or that would be great. So. And then we also, for some who are just wanting to learn a little bit more about us, um, we do have a daily message we send out. You can like us on Facebook, or you can also um, ask to um, receive the daily message in your mailbox. It's on our website. Oh, Michelle, you're on de-schooling and unschooling. Yeah, sometimes it's harder for us to do it than it is for the kids. Um, you're asking, Elaine, that's a good question. Your first exposure, you understand it's a program, but can some of the elements be applied to project-based, self-directed learning? I think project-based and self-directed learning are part of self-design. We just look at it over a lifetime, and we look at it uh, within kind of a framework of 
having some principles and some models. And I couldn't get into all the models, and I, I obviously couldn't talk about all the different principles that we're based on. Um, but again, if you, as you take a look at some of the more, some of the materials on the website, you'll see that there's some things. We have a, um, a self-designed path that helps people kind of get oriented to some of the sensibilities that we have within self-design, um, like taking the world view of another and, and mutual respect and uh, developing a, a way of looking at the world curiously and what does advocacy look like. So we have a little bit, some of the other things in there too. And those are some of the things that we talk about in our learning circles. Jen's mentioning here that we also help parents think about how to consider mentors for their children to create authentic learning experiences. Yes, because as our kids get older, um, they want, they may have interest in things that we can't do. And so we help expand beyond the family. Yes, I do, I certainly welcome to follow me on Pinterest. I'm, Pinterest is a great place where I put all my quirky things. Um, oh, great question, Jane. Are there examples of kids collaborating to give back to society? Yes, in fact, our kids, um, the high school kids just went down to Los Somos Village in Guatemala and did some building work and did some work with the kids. Um, it's a village that um, takes care of kids whose parents aren't able to. Um, we also went up to the First Nations. Um, so we have kids doing that all the time. Brent actually did his um, doctoral dissertation on the kids, the first kids from Wonder Tree. And he was quite amazed at the fact that they really sought out um, balanced lives that were meaningful and relevant to them, as well as ones in which they could, felt they could make a contribution to. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, check a look, take a look at our website. There's some of the examples there. You know, Lainey, I love it. You see these tools working for you. We think that's the greatest thing to do. We really encourage families um, to do it. I do a learning, I do a mind map, and I um, create learning plans for myself, too. Um, and it is amazing just writing those things down that it helps me stay focused. Yes, the principles are discussed in the book um, more. But again, like I said, it just takes... Um, we would need a whole other session, maybe, you know, a workshop to talk about some of the basic principles. But I think um, the holistic and the child-centered learning, we really look to honor our learners and honor their growth process, Debbie. And um, sometimes that requires some shifts um, in how we language things and how we talk and how we think. And a lot of the growth is in ourselves. Um, as we shift and we make those changes, it helps in our family. Kathy Ann's mentioning that uh, her mother asked her to do a mind map. <laughs> and 80 is not too old. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, Jane. Just did an experiment to bring 30 people together to do projects globally. Oh, yeah. Please, yeah, share some of those ideas with us. We'd love them. Elizabeth's saying this is her first year with self-design. And you've been with, oh, you've been with Wonder Tree and the Home Learning Network. Wonderful. Yes. Self-design certainly augments learning in a freestyle, very much. Yeah. I'm so glad. Yeah, we do really think it is important for kids to understand um, the give and the receive part. Yeah, very much. Oh, I'm glad. I hope you enjoy the website and look around. We're the same age. There you go. Um, AJ, how did that work when your kids took um, K-12? Did they like it? I can tell you a little bit about how ours is similar and different. Yeah, I, um, uh, my, kids, uh, my kids really loved, uh, loved the learning and the way it was designed, uh, the way it uh, took them uh, along in the process. So it was, it was pretty, like my, my older daughter, Loved it so much that right now she's in school and she's saying that, Dad, I'm not learning and I want to go, I want to do or design my own learning. Oh. That's awesome. Um, K-12, what we found is it works very well for kids who are good readers, um, who like um, a more a linear kind of approach to learning and that like the, the comfort of that structure of knowing when they're making progress and getting feedback and moving forward. Um, our experience has been with kids that are a little bit more liking project-based learning who need that big picture first. And um, that's been a little bit more challenging. 
I see. So, so yeah, what, when, uh, when it works, it works well. So uh, is there, uh, like, when, when, the, when somebody designs their own learning uh, map, do, is there a, like, a guiding curriculum that you follow or some guidelines or, or, or how do you do that? Good question. Well, you know, there's, there's some basic strands in math that we know. There's, you know, there's an arithmetic one, there's a geometry one, um, there's fractions. So most of our, our learning consultants know that. And we're not saying that we don't ever use, um, you know, commercial curriculum. What we're really saying is we want to make sure that, that the curriculum matches the learner. So if we have a learner who's a very hands-on learner and and we want the learning to be meaningful and relevant, they may be learning their math through their interest in dinosaurs. If it's someone like your daughter who likes a structured learning program, she may be just fine if she has a book and she gets to go at her own pace because she learns by reading. There might be someone else who says, you know, this is something I really learn best when I'm playing games and when I have some novelty. And we notice those things. So we look for resources and we design the curriculum to meet the needs of the learner where they are, as opposed to saying, gee, you're 10, so you need to have the book that goes with third grade. And everybody needs to be working on their multiplication tables. So instead, we would say, where, where are you? What are you learning? I, you know, I had one little guy, one of my kids went to first grade, and he could add, subtract, multiply, and divide. Well, you know, it didn't help for them to give him a first grade curriculum or a second grade curriculum. Um, this is before I was home learning. I managed to convince them to not do anything. Just don't do anything. We'll do it at home. And so they would just give him his one sheet and send him off to the math lab. And we did our work because he was, you know, he didn't need to do 30 problems of, you know, 6 plus 2 or 9 plus 3. Um, he was doing a lot of the work in his head. So when we use a curriculum, we there are some there's some guidelines that we know. We know how math skills tend to develop. But there are also some kids who just skip. They really don't need that linear process. Does that help you a little bit? Yep. Thank you. So, Monica, it looks like we're getting on to the hours. We should take a final question to make sure we can get the room closed out at 4 p.m. for the next speaker. Sounds good. Any other last questions? I'm just going to say happy to have a longer conversation another time. Great. I hope it was helpful, and I'm happy to talk with anybody at another time. Joyful learning. Yes, everyone. Thanks so much. Great to connect with you again, Allison. <laughs> Small world. Monica, I have um, um, I've sent you an email uh, requesting a time for, for a Skype call. So just wait to hear back from you. Sounds good. I will email you back as soon as we're done. Thanks a lot. We'll see if we can close out this room. Thank you so much. Have a great night, everybody.